Bibles with me to Exodus. I notice a few new faces here this morning, and it is our practice here at Emmaus to go through books of the Bible. And we are in Exodus chapter 7. And uh, just to catch you up before I have this extended reading, um, we've reached the plague narrative. If you remember back in Exodus 5, Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh and said, hey, let us go. Let, his, let God's people go so they might go worship him in the wilderness. And if you don't, uh, he will strike pestilence upon you. So there has been a clear warning. There's been a sign now given. Last time we were in Exodus, we saw the staff that Aaron threw on the ground became a serpent, swallowed up the other staffs that the magicians did. And yet, Pharaoh did not heed the word of the Lord. So we come to Exodus 7 now. Let's read God's word. The reading of God's word honors him as we give ourselves to his authority. Exodus 7, verses 14 through 8, 19. These are the first three plagues. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and in the vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. He would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went to his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people, and into your own ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come upon you and on your people and all your servants. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his land over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people, that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs, as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. This is God's word. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we seek to see your power made known. We read in Scripture, but we know that we need eyes of faith to believe these things happened, and that you are omnipotent, that you are the true and living God, and there is no one like you. Instill in our hearts strong faith so that we might be a submissive people and honor and respect you. In Christ's name, amen. The history recorded in Scripture is not primarily recorded so that we will have a, a good story to tell around a fire or even some sort of like fable-like thing where we have a good moral to be able to deduce from the story. I do that with my kids a lot, with Aesop's fables and that type of thing. What is taking place in the narrative of Scripture is actually God making himself known. The scriptures are revelatory. God, in his demonstrations of power and judgment and mercy, is glorifying himself. We see that no differently in the narrative of the plagues. I've titled this series, Through the Plague Narrative, as God Makes Himself Known. That's the central theme. And we're going to look at three cycles of these plagues. So I'll do three sermons through the first nine plagues. And the overarching emphasis is really the same. God is making himself know. How? By gut judging his enemies with decreation, this undoing of the cosmos, so that he might bring Israel into new creation. And if this is the first time you've heard this sort of language of decreation and new creation, we're going to see that that is a theme throughout all of Scripture. But as we look at these plagues, I'm going to be pulling out certain lessons that we can learn as God is revealing himself to us that we can then draw our attention to as we're going to see some uh, repetition taking place. So this morning, I want to draw your attention to two lessons from this first cycle, and that's the nature of the plagues themselves, ends up being somewhat introductory material, and then also the nature of unbelief. We see those two things happening here that I want to focus in on. So first, the nature of the plagues themselves. There's much we could cover here. There's very much information regarding this, but I want to look at three aspects. It's important to first note that these plagues are penal. That is, they are punishments. In verse 14, we see, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, as he's going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Then in chapter 8, verse 1, then the Lord said to Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will do this. I will bring a plague. I will bring frogs. And so I'm merely stating the obvious. This is God, the just one, meeting disobedience with punishment. Interesting enough, God even says he's punishing the gods of the Egyptians in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, listen to this. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in their land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. There is disobedience taking place by Pharaoh, by the people of Egypt, that are going to receive God's just judgments. He mentions these gods of Egypt, although they're not truly gods, they're fake figments of these people's imagination, but they are believing these things. He's going to show that he is the one true God. 
So this is straightforward. It's obvious. These are penal. Why do I make mention of it here then? Because Scripture takes great pains to show all throughout the Bible that God is a just God and that he has standards that he has given mankind. And when those do not go heeded, he judges, he punishes. Let us be reminded of what took place in the flood. Every thought of man's heart was only evil continually, and he brought the flood. We saw it in Babel. We see it here in judgments. We see it, it if we follow this out through the wilderness wanderings, when 3,000 people who committed idolatry are swallowed up. Nadab and Abihu. We see the conquest of the Canaanite nations. Nebuchadnezzar later, the king, will be turned into a beast. On and on, even into the New Testament with Ananias and Sapphira who lie to the Holy Spirit, God strikes them dead. Even to the Corinthian church members who took the Lord's Supper in an unworthy matter. Wiped out. Dead. This is a sobering reality that we can't think about enough. God is a just judge. His standard never changes, by the way. Never. And that's why we become, as sinners, indebted to God. Listen to what the scriptures teach, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written into the book of the law and do them. James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. And that's why Paul can say to people who are trusting in their own works as if they're a good person or they're doing certain religious activities, he says all who rely on works of law will be judged by the law. The, the law actually brings knowledge of sin. There's no way that you could be good enough to stand before God. So what is the issue? Well, this is the consuming fire God who you don't want to play with, actually then says in Galatians 4, sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that he might receive, we might receive adoption as sons. How does that work? How does Christ redeem us? According to Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. These plagues are penal. God is just in demanding at this point retribution for their disobedience. And he can at any moment do that as well. We all fall under the curse as those born in Adam. But those who are trusting in the one who was cursed for us have justice satisfied in him. If you're trusting in anything other than the work of Christ today, be it known, you will perish. God's justice is Unbending, unyielding, yet it is completely satisfied in the work of Christ. The second aspect of the nature of the plagues that I want to bring out here is that they are revelational. And by that I mean they reveal. It's worth asking the question, why the first nine plagues? Why nine plagues? Why the, didn't it seem like the tenth plague, if you know the story, is the one that actually brought about the exodus? Why not skip straight to the tenth? Why all the bother with these differing plagues and all the suffering that's brought about? Well, the answer comes in Exodus 9, verse 15 and 16. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. I could have just wiped you out. But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God is answering that question that Pharaoh sarcastically explained earlier when Moses came to him initially. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? God is going to make himself known, not just in Egypt, but all throughout the world as the sovereign, powerful creator God. And so when we looked last time we were in Exodus 7, verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Verse 17 here. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. And then at the removal of the frogs in chapter 8, verse 10. 
be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Do you see what he's doing here? God is about his own glory, and I hope you're very comfortable with that by now if you've been a part of Emmaus. God is not vain in doing that. He, he's not prideful. God is doing what God should do, which is show himself to be magnificent, and all who will have the eyes of faith are blessed as they look to him. And so he, in his sovereignty, demonstrates who he is through his acts of judgment. Well, what will they know? Well, according to 8.10, they'll know that he's the only true God. All these gods that they're trusting in, the sun god, the river god, the frog goddess, all this is futile. After the exodus, and Moses and the people are on the other side of the shores after the Egyptian armies have been destroyed. What does he say? Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? What else will the world learn? Well, they will know that he is the Lord. Not only that he's the only God, but he's actually the sovereign, omnipotent creator. He can bring the plague at any moment, and he can then have it recede or end exactly at his doing. We saw Mo, uh, Pharaoh, when we read the scriptures, ask Moses, please take away the frogs. And just to be clear that it's God who does this, he says, when would you like me to ask God? Just so we're clear. Tomorrow? Okay. And it's exactly that. To show that he is powerful and he's the one in control. His power is unmatched and unrivaled. We saw this with these serpents. When the staff had become a serpent, what happened? They actually ate the other, the, the serpent actually ate the other serpents. And we see it also in this passage, 819. What happens? After God makes the gnats, these magicians are no longer able to do that. And it says this, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, unrivaled. They can't do with their secret arts or the power of Satan, whatever. What God can do, he's showing himself to be unrivaled. This is the finger of God. And that same power was also evidenced in other parts of Scripture. In Luke eleven twenty, 20, it's no surprise that Jesus claims this. But, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Christ casting out demons, but also demonstrating his power over nature, turning water to wine, walking on water, calming the storm, feeding the 5,000, catching all the fish, power over disease, power over death. Why? What was he doing? He's able to do these things to show that it is very clear that the God of the Old Testament is walking among his people. He is once again, manipulating the creator order to bring blessing and relief to his people. This is Christ, the creator. All things were made through him and for him. Unrivaled power. Yet, what is so fascinating about the gospel is this unrivaled power is demonstrated in the God-man, which then gives him the possibility and the opportunity to do something that God normally can't do, which is to demonstrate weakness. 2 Corinthians 13, 4, Paul says this, for he was crucified in weakness. He took the posture of weakness. He was helpless like a sheep led to the slaughter. According to Spurgeon, our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished the mighty purpose by becoming weak. Through his weakness, he became able to suffer and to die in order to save us from the thraldom of sin. This is what's so awesome. This powerful God of the plagues, the powerful God in Christ who can still the storm, who can uh, bring about 5,000 loaves to feed that many people, also was crucified in weakness. But he did not remain weak as he was raised from the dead. Paul says, that he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. God reveals himself through the plagues as the God who has 
ultimate sovereign power. And yet that same God who became weak for us in our salvation. The third aspect I want to highlight about these plagues is that they are decreational. So penal, revelational, and decreational. The plagues can also be shown to be a, a coming apart of the cosmos. The world being undone. I think of the movie Inception, if you've seen that. In the dreams, these people are unaware they're dreaming, but when things start to happen around them that are completely abnormal, there's a very uncomfortable feeling they start to have. When everything's going normal, natural laws are in place, everything's cool, but when things start getting supernatural, there's this uneasy type feeling. You could only imagine what is taking place in Egypt at this time, the feelings that are happening. And so this is an undoing of the cosmos, as many commentators and theologians have spoken of. The parallels between God showing himself to be the powerful creator decreates. For example, when God created the world, he gathered the water into one place. But in the first plague, the water was turned to blood. People were supposed to rule and fill the land. But what's happening in the plagues? The opposite is true. Bugs and locusts fill and rule the land. Light and dark are supposed to be this day-night cycle, according to Genesis 1 and 2. And yet, what happens in the ninth plague? The cycle is gone. Darkness envelops everything. In Genesis 1 and 2, things are green and lush. In the plagues, the locusts come and devour everything to where everything becomes brown and black. When God created the world, he made land, animals, and people, but the third through the sixth plagues, what? Bring boils, pestilence all over both man and beast until God finally kills every firstborn son in Egypt. The hail and the fire evoke the image of the sky breaking up and falling down. This is the undoing of the created order. It's uneasy. It's terrifying. It's horrible. It is the ultimate power display. All ending in what? This time when the Red Sea is split in two, water's up on each side. Everything looks like it's in order for the people of God. But as soon as the evil Egyptians step on the dry land, the waters come crashing on them. Chaos. This is decreation. Is it just to show, though, that God is sovereign over creation, that he's the powerful maker of heaven and earth? I think there's more to it. This decreation paves the way for new creation. New creation is a theological concept that God is making things new. What was undone through sin and then the curse is then being reconciled through new creation. So that's where we get our big, big idea. God judges with decreation to deliver Israel into new creation. This is the pattern in Scripture. I want to remind you. What happened in the flood? Genesis 6, the people were sinning against God. What does he do? He destroys them by taking the, the waters and crashing upon them in judgment. What comes after Noah and his family start new. New creation. The Tower of Babel. They're seeking to ascend to heaven, and God scrambles their language so they can't do that. Chaos ensues. Immediately after that, Abraham, new creation, a new beginning. We come to the plagues of judgment, decreation, only then to have the people of God walk through the dry ground of the Red Sea to come out the other side in a new relationship with God, serving him with his law, his spirit, his presence with them. New creation in their own land. And then that's why we see also in Revelation, the end, right? What, what is taking place? You try and understand the book of Revelation. You get into that imagery. What's happening? It's all plague language, connecting it back to Egypt. Why? It's decreation happening before what? Before the new heavens and the new earth, and all things are put right, and God's people dwell with him forever and ever. The plagues come, decreation before new creation. But what's so fascinating about this is this language of new creation is also used of our salvation. What we are experiencing now is called new creation. Galatians, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Ephesians 2.10, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. James 1.18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So there's a new creation that's taken place already. This is called the already, not yet. What we are experiencing now will be fully manifested at the consummation. That's a theological sort of framework for understanding scripture. I've described new creation for our salvation, but I also said before that decreation comes before new creation. So what's the decreation talked about? What, where's that at when it's coming to our salvation? Well, that's why the gospel writers at Christ's crucifixion bring out the emphasis that what is taking place there is plague-like imagery. Darkness came over the earth. The earth shook. Rocks split. There was a death of the firstborn son. He's the Passover lamb. These are all the themes of Exodus coming together on Christ. Why? He's taking the plagues, the judgment, for who? For his people. He's becoming the enemy of God. He's punished in our place. All that's deserved of us, the curse, he became a curse for us. Decreation before new creation. In the book, Lord of the Rings, Sam Ganji, a fictional character in, in, in this book, says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Is everything sad going to, be, to come untrue? And really the resurrection is the Christian answer to that question. Yes, everything sad is going to be untrue. Christ, who was cursed, became the plagues for us, was punished, actually rose from the dead, which was the beginning of a new creation. He's raised from the dead on the first day of the week. The eighth day, you might say, as scripture calls it. It's the dawning of a new creation week. God has done something new in Christ at the resurrection. And so 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of Christ as the first fruits of what is to come. All those who are in Christ will be also raised with him in new creation life. Physically, we'll experience at the resurrection the consummation of all things, but spiritually even now. And that's why Romans 6, a great passage we share at baptism all the way. All the time. Should you continue in sin that grace may abound? No, may it never be. You died with Christ. He took your punishment. You were in him. And now you've also been raised with him to newness of life. So, brothers and sisters, application from this. Are you living this new creation sort of life that the scriptures call we're in? Are you functioning in this in this? place of, I, I, you know, I, I'm always going to be this way. I'm always going to struggle with this. I'm never going to get over this. I'm never going to change. Or maybe you're on this side where you're always experiencing the threatening punishments of God, and you're, you're wondering if you're going to have that plague of hell fall upon you, even as a believer. No, this is new creation that's taken place. Enter in. Believe. The Apostle Paul calls that in Colossians chapter 3, this heavenly type of mentality, this heavenly thinking. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. He says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears... Then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what's earthly in you. So live out this new creation reality today. So that's the first lesson in this cycle of the plagues as we looked at. Penal, revelational, decreational, all abounding to the glory of God. But that's not all that's here. And I think we can learn also about unbelief from this. I think if we dig in here and look at Pharaoh and, and the magicians and all this, we, we really can grasp what's taking place when somebody doesn't believe God. They might see things that are taking place where God is making himself known, but yet 
it's one thing to know that these things are happening and to believe they exist. It's another to actually have faith. So first aspect we'll look at here is that unbelief is inexcusable. Inexcusable. Think about Pharaoh. He's told Pharaoh who he is in chapter 3. He's told him what God requires of him, let my people go that they may serve him. He's proven the validity of that message by demonstrating signs. He's warned him of the consequences. I'll bring pestilence on you. Pharaoh is without excuse. Okay, so he's the example of unbelief. He doesn't have excuse. But I want to show you that that extends beyond just Pharaoh or somebody who's had direct revelation from God in, in the form of God speaking to him through a prophet. It extends to all mankind. And that's what Paul says in Romans 1.18, that the wrath of God is revealed against ungodliness of those who suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. So, here's the conclusion, they are without excuse. By what God has made, every man knows that God exists, he's immortal, and he needs to be obeyed. Not only that, there's a conscience, Romans 2, When Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So if we're saying, okay, unbelief is when the word of God is presented to somebody, the gospel, or they've seen a miracle or something like that, and then they don't believe. No, unbelief is the state that man is in by nature. Rebelling against God's natural creation, his revelation. But if they just heard the gospel, they would be saved. We get that idea that, you know, like we've got to take the gospel to the nations, and if they would just hear, they'd be saved. Not necessarily. And that's because of this second aspect of unbelief. Oftentimes it's irrational. When we look at this account, we can sympathize with Pharaoh in one sense why he hasn't turned. Why is that? Well, his magicians have been able to do the same signs that God is doing. We see them turn water to blood. We've seen them bring about frogs. We saw them when he cast this, the staff down, it became a serpent. So we can sympathize. Okay, I can understand how Pharaoh maybe isn't like convinced. But at the same time, there's been these hints that have shown that God is more powerful than these magicians. The serpent that Aaron's staff became swallowed up the other serpents. We see that God is able to take away the frogs at his beck and call. The, since Pharaoh is going to Moses and saying, hey, can you please take these away? Obviously, his magicians can't do that. But when it comes to the gnats, they cannot do this sign. The magicians in verse 18 of chapter 8, the magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. And his own magicians say, hey, truly, this is is the finger of God. We need to listen up. Finally, here they are. They come to their senses. But Pharaoh doesn't. And this is because unbelief is irrational. You've heard many people say the same thing. I'm sure in your evangelism, you've had people come across this where they say, you know what, if God would just show himself to me, if God would just reveal himself, or if he would speak to me audibly or show me some sign, I would believe in him. Have you heard that? Happens a lot. But that goes against the testimony of Scripture and of history. In Luke 16, Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man is cast into hell And in this story, asked Abraham if Abraham would send Lazarus, who was the poor man, to go tell his brothers, his family, not to not to not believe and then find himself in the same hellish place. But what what does the scripture say there? Abraham says, "They, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. No, but if somebody goes back from the dead, 
they'll believe. And he says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, it's not like they didn't know he was doing signs. After he raised Lazarus from the dead, what did they say? They actually convened together a council and they say, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. You know, if we let him go on like this, everybody's going to believe in him. So you get, you get what I'm saying here. Unbelief is irrational. Can look at the evidence, the facts, everything, and just say, you don't have to. No. And then we also see it in the people. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Okay, the implication of all this, because we could get into Pilate, we could get into all these examples of people seeing God's miraculous doings and then hardening or not believing the implication is that you can't argue someone into the kingdom, all right? You can present all the most logical and rational arguments for the truthfulness and, and validity of the Bible and why this all makes sense, but really, we're dead in trespasses and sins. We're blinded to the things of God. They must be born again. And so this third aspect, which is one of the most mysterious and scary aspects of unbelief, not only is it inexcusable, man's responsible for his sin of unbelief, not only is it irrational, it's also inescapable. Inescapable. Pharaoh's heart was hardened in verse 19. It says, But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Now, we've got this interesting thing happening in these plague, the plague narrative where Pharaoh is hardening his own heart, God's hardening his heart. But the key that we see here is these last words there, as the Lord had said. When did the Lord say something about Pharaoh's heart? Well, Exodus 7, 3. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, what? He won't obey. And we know why God does that. He's, we've already explained it. He's, he's making himself know. He's demonstrating his power by these miraculous wonders and signs. But is this just Pharaoh we see this example in Scripture? Is this a unique case where God wants to show himself to the, all the world as powerful so that in this case he hardens Pharaoh's heart? Well, we see other places of Scripture like in the life and ministry of Christ specifically in the death and crucifixion. The language is exactly the same. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter's preaching, he's wanting to point the finger at these people, show them to be guilty that they just put Christ on the cross. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by what? By the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death. Acts 4 gets even explicit and names names. Acts 4, 27 through 28. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people's of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Oh my goodness. Whatever your plan had predestined to take place. Okay, so is this just kings? Okay, so we've seen Pharaoh, and now we've seen these like leaders of uh, religious leaders and Pilate. So maybe God just turns the heart of the kings to do his purposes and will. And so the hardening takes place then. But then we get even more explicit in 1 Peter 2, 7 that we covered back in our, our series of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2, 7. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. I merely bring this up because I want to make it very clear that there's only one free being 
in the world, and that's God. He's the free one, and he calls the shots, which allows him to declare, as we're going to see in Exodus 33, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. It's his choice, his sovereign prerogative to determine whom he will save or whom he will harden. This is meant to bring awe in our lives. It's supposed to say, wow, this God is so unique and exclaim like Moses on the dry sands after the Red Sea. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Now, some people, after hearing about the plagues, the God of the plagues, or the God who initiates salvation, they will say, you know what, if that's who God is like, I want nothing to do with him. And it's then when I tremble and I say, oh, Lord. That is, it's a statement of self-righteousness. It puts us in the place of judging the Almighty, the Holy One. No, 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 no. Who has God revealed himself to be? We've got our eyes to the scripture. God is making himself known. Who is he? There's no one like him. The God who judges and also saves. So the question for you is this. God has made himself known. Do you know him? Even more importantly, does he know you? The scriptures speak both ways. That God has made himself known, we are to know him, but we also to be known by him. How do we know we've been known by him? Paul is very clear in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Jesus says in Matthew 7 to these people who are casting out demons in Christ's name, he says, look, 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 depart from me. I never knew you. And how, what does he say? You workers of lawlessness. These people characterized by disobedience. They don't love God. They're saying they know things about God and maybe even doing some things related to God, but they don't know him. How can you know you know God? Do you love him? We've actually been studying 1 John, these, these tests that you might know you have eternal life, according to 1 John 5. What is it? Well, there's the doctrinal test. Do you know Christ, who he is, that he's the Savior of the world, that he's God in the flesh, taking your sins on the cross, raising from the dead, giving you this eternal life? But also there's a moral test. Do you obey him? Do you love him? Do you obey him and follow after his commands? So there's not only a doctrinal, a moral, but there's also a social test. Do you love the brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you love the church? Do you love the family of God? That then you know God, and that's the case. Only by knowing him, knowing God, can we do what we were created and recreated for, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. May we be a church that does this. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for your word uh, that is powerful. Even with my inadequacies as a pastor, as a speaker, you, by your power of the Spirit among us, can change hearts. No one can see the kingdom unless they be born again, but you, by this power of the Spirit, move and do according to your desire, your will. You not only save people, but you also sanctify your people, opening the eyes of our hearts to believe the Scriptures, to know the one and true living God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And because of that, we have eternal life. Or maybe be a people who knows you, loves you, and because of that wants to proclaim who you are to a lost and fallen world. May these plagues, these judgments, stir in us awe that you are truly a consuming fire and cause us to be so thankful for the salvation you've given us in Christ. For we deserve that same judgment. And then may we also live as a people in the new creation, as those who have been brought from death to life, who exhibit the fruit of the Spirit and bring life to this world through our actions and our words. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.